This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. We're just kicking off a whole new year, and there are big things in the works for Once Upon a Crime in 2022. Thank you so much for coming along with me on my true crime journey. Whether you've been listening from the beginning or have just recently found the show, I really appreciate you. Because we're transitioning into a whole new phase of the podcast, and there's so much we'll be rolling out to you soon, we're going to do something a little different for this first episode of the year. Our new series will begin later this month, but for this episode, I'm going to present a type of case I usually only reserve for my Patreon members. I call these episodes Murder in My Hometown because I'm connected to them locally or have personal knowledge of these cases, or sometimes both. In these episodes, you'll sometimes get inside information about me, my life, etc., something I don't often share on the podcast. So with that being said, let's get into this case. This is Murder in My Hometown, The Disappearance of Janine Sanchez Harms. So there was one case that I really wanted to tell you guys about that happened right here in my hometown. But this case has a super crazy twist to it that I think that you may be like, what? (laughs) When I get to that, I live in San Jose, California. Most of you guys know that it's the Bay Area, South Bay Area. People call it the San Francisco Bay Area, but we're kind of south of there, about 45 minutes south of San Francisco. San Jose is a pretty large city. There are some other kind of offshoot little towns kind of on the outskirts of San Jose. And that's kind of where I live. I live in San Jose proper, but I'm really just a couple of blocks from a town called Campbell, California. And that's actually where I'm at right now. That's where I have my office where I do my recording. So this is super local to me. So I'm going to tell you a little about the day that everything kind of unfolded and go from there. This started out on uh, Friday, July 27th, 2001. It was the middle of a hot summer here in San Jose. A woman named Janine Sanchez Harms, her maiden name was Sanchez, her married name was Harms. She was somewhat recently divorced. So she was single and she was going to have a night out with a friend for dinner. Now, the place where she was going to have dinner, I could literally see it from where my office is right now. It's basically right across the street. There is a big kind of shopping center on this main street that's called uh, the Prune Yard Shopping Center. It's kind of typical of a larger shopping center. There's several buildings. There's lots of restaurants, shops, bars, breweries, you know, all of that right there. The place that she was going to go, you guys might know this restaurant because it's a chain. It's called Buca de Beppo. It's a Italian restaurant. It's in the shopping center. It's kind of in the back area of this building. It's, it was kind of a bigger restaurant. So anyway, she went to go meet her friend named Janice there for dinner. And the reason she was meeting her friend there is because she kind of wanted to talk to her. She was a little bit nervous because she had a somewhat of a blind date that same night. So she was going to meet her friend first and then basically go across the parking lot. There was another restaurant, another chain restaurant called the Rock Bottom Brewery. And that's also a chain you guys might know of. So she was supposed to meet a man named Alex Wilson there that night. She was having this dinner with her friend and she told her about that she wasn't really looking forward to this date. So the man she was supposed to meet was named William Alex Wilson III. Now, he went by Alex, okay? So we're just going to call him Alex or Alex Wilson. Janine Sanchez Harms was born on June 10th, 1959. She was a local girl here in San Jose. She attended Prospect High School, which is just down the road here. She also attended San Jose State University. She was petite. She was actually a Latina and dark hair, dark eyed, kind of light skin. She was five foot five, 110 pounds. She was a fitness buff. 
And uh, one thing some people uh, said is she had a tendency to maybe drink a little bit and party too much. It wasn't like an alcoholic type thing. It was just she liked to party and go out with friends. She had been married to a man named Randy Harms for a time. And like I said, she had recently got divorced. She was very social. She didn't like to be alone. She was lonely. And she had a boyfriend for a time, but they had recently broken up at this time that I'm going to be telling you about this story. And so she was looking for a new relationship. So she was hanging out with friends, you know, going out to meet people, all of that. She really just didn't like to be alone. Janine's parents were Jess Sanchez, which is funny because that was my grandfather's name was Jess Sanchez. <laughs> and her mother was Georgette. Her parents also lived here, right here in Campbell. And Janine actually lived in Los Gatos, which is the next town over. It's basically adjacent to Campbell, very close by. So she had several brothers, brother Wayne, Randy, and Craig. I believe she was the only, maybe she was the only girl in the family, but she, I know she had at least three brothers. And she worked as a tech firm manager at a company called Amdahl in Sunnyvale, which is now Fujitsu. So then at the time it was still Amdahl. She had worked there for over 12 years. And a lot of her friends and acquaintances were co-workers. And Janice, though, was somebody that she had known since she was like a teen. They had known each other for, you know, over 25 years, just really good friends. Okay, let's go back to this dinner that she's having at Buca de Beppo. So she's telling her friend Janice about meeting this guy, Alex Wilson. She had been out with her friends after work, her co-workers after work, having some drinks at a restaurant. And as she was leaving, she went to hand a business card to somebody. I don't know if it's somebody that she had met that night or, you know, somebody that she was talking to from work. I'm not sure. But she was handing a business card to someone. But Alex Wilson, who was not with the group, he just happened to be standing there. You know, he saw this pretty dark haired girl, you know, and I guess he was attracted to her. And while she started to hand their business card out to this other person, he took it, which is kind of forward. <laughs> So she wasn't too sure about that. She didn't know if that was a, if she really appreciated that. But now he has her number. He starts calling her repeatedly to ask her out. She thought he was kind of arrogant. She didn't really like his personality. So she just kept saying, yeah, no, I'm busy or whatever. Now, here's the thing, you guys, women, men, anybody, you're approached by somebody, you don't like somebody, just tell them, you know, no, I'm not interested. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> hang up. You know, you don't even have to say thank you. Just hang up. But Janine was the kind of person who was just a very nice person. She had a hard time saying no to people, her friend said. So she didn't give him like a cutoff, like brush off. She just was like, yeah, I'm kind of busy. I can't do it, you know. So he kept calling her. Finally, she agreed to meet him for a drink or dinner or something, but she didn't show up. She basically stood him up. Now, this is why it's just better just to cut it, you know, because now what happened is he called her again. He's like, hey, you know, I thought we were going to meet up and you didn't show up. And now she feels guilty. So she made up some excuse to spare his feelings instead of saying, dude, you know what? I really just didn't want to go out with you. She said, I had a family emergency. I'm so sorry. And she kind of feels guilty enough that she finally agrees to meet him for a drink. And that was that Friday night that she was with her friend Janice. So she tells her friend that she considers him obnoxious. And she also does not want to be alone with him because I don't know, she just didn't get a good vibe or something, or maybe she just didn't like him. So that's why she told her, you know, meet me at the Rock Bottom Brewery, sit in the bar, there's other people, and maybe she could just have a drink and then just blow him off, I guess, was kind of the idea. At least that's what she was thinking. So she finishes her dinner with her friend, Janice, says goodbye, walks across the parking lot to the brewery, and she sits in the bar waiting for him to show up. Now, okay, this guy <laughs> has been calling her repeatedly, you know, insisting that she meet him to go out and now he's late. Now, what is that? Some kind of power play? I just, that's just not cool. So he finally shows up 30 minutes late, but by this time she had struck up a conversation with a whole group of people. There was men and there was a woman named Savannah Bryan. She starts talking to this group. I don't know. They just, you know, start a conversation. Well, Savannah is there with a group of coworkers and one of her coworkers is a 43-year-old man named Maurice Nesma. So now she's sitting with this group at their table having drinks. Alex shows up and he joins the group. So now everybody's drinking and socializing. And that's kind of what she wanted because she didn't want to be alone with him. So I guess that kind of worked out for her. I don't know that he appreciated it too much. And later on, we'll hear from him about what he thought. But Savannah kind of says, I have to go. And she takes off. But Janine stays with the group. 
they decided to take the party down the street to a nearby bar called Quartz Lounge. Again, from where I'm sitting right now in my studio, I could walk there in about four minutes. It's right across the street. It's just a little local dive bar. It's been there forever. It's kind of a little bit of a, well, at least now, and I assume it's probably the same then, because it's a little bit of a dive bar. It's not like a club where, you know, young people are going to go get all dressed up and, you know, go dancing. It's just, it's got some darts and a pool table and, you know, cheap drinks. And it's usually a little bit of an older crowd, which, you know, they're in their 40s, late 30s and 40s, this whole group that she's with. So it kind of makes sense. That's the place just to go hang out. Janine's friend Janice said, at dinner, we had a couple of drinks, or she had a couple of drinks. Then she goes over to the um, rock bottom and has some more drinks. Then she goes to the courts and lounge and she has some more drinks. You know, this is over a few hours. So I'm not saying, you know, like she's binge drinking or anything like that, but I'd imagine at that time, she's a little tipsy. So what happens is she ends up getting in an argument with another patron at the bar. I'm not sure what that was about. They said something about they were arguing about music or something. I mean, maybe, you know how you are when maybe when you, you or somebody you know who's drinking and they start saying, ah, oh, turn that song off, that sucks. Or, you know, maybe it was something like that. I don't think it was anything like terrible. But anyway, that happens. So she decides to leave the bar. But I think that, it's kind of like that time where it's still early enough where you're thinking, hey, I'm not ready for the party to end, but I want to get out of this bar. She had driven actually to the, the bar, the Quartz Lounge, from the Rock Bottom Brewery. She had actually driven both Alex Wilson and uh, Maurice Nesma, which is the guy that she had just met. And Wilson is the guy she was supposed to have the date with. So they were both in her car. So this is a little weird. You got this third wheel coming along. He's, he's in the back seat. So they leave the bar. She takes both of them back in her car because she had driven them there, drives them back to the rock bottom to get their cars. They all end up in the parking lot of this shopping center and pick up their cars. Now, the next series of events are a little bit sketchy. We're not exactly sure what happened. We do know that Janine drives home. So her house is in Los Gatos. It's about a nine minute, eight or nine minute drive from the prune yard where they were at. So it's very close. We know that she drives home. Investigators would believe that she had possibly invited both Alex Wilson and Maurice Nesma to meet her at her house to have some more drinks. We do know that she stopped at a Jiffy Market, which is just like doors down from her house, and bought some beer. Now, she doesn't drink beer. Her friends say she does, she's not a beer drinker. She doesn't like beer. So she must have bought, because the the owner there said, you know, he knew her. Yes, she came in. It was probably around 10, 30, 11 p.m., something like that, where she came in and bought a six-pack of beer. So it sounded like she was going to have some company over. They were going to continue drinking. And her friends believed that she would have invited whoever she was with back to the house. Here's the other thing, too. They said, you know, she was very safety conscious. Like she had all of these locks on her door and, you know, was careful about where she was. But because she was very social, because she didn't like to be alone, she sometimes would invite people she just met back to her place to, you know, hang out and, and have a party. Now, they think that she was expecting both them and maybe more people to come. But what happens is what we find out later is that only Maurice Nesma shows up. So he's basically alone. Alex has taken off. He was supposed to come to her house, but he didn't show up. So friends said that they didn't believe she would be attracted to Nesma because Nesma was shorter, stocky built. He had dark hair. He was balding. And Janine's friend said that she liked tall, blonde, athletic types. Her husband, Randy Harms, was this type. And that's the kind of guy she liked to date or was attracted to. After that, we don't know exactly what happened. Now, when they finally do find uh, Nesma, they ask him what, what happened. He says that he did go to the house. They thought that Alex was coming. He didn't show up. He said they drank the beer. And then Janine fell asleep on her couch. And then he left after she fell asleep. And he said this was about after midnight. Alex Wilson would tell the police that he saw Janine leaving the parking lot at the rock bottom with a green Jeep following her, which was Nesma's Jeep. He had a green 1993 Jeep Cherokee. But right away, the cops zero in on Alex Wilson as a suspect, probably because of the story that her friend told about how she didn't like him, how he was so persistent. And she kind of had stood him up before. 
you know, she had gone to the bar not just with him, but she had taken a whole group of people. I mean, you could see where maybe you think this guy would be a little bit put out by her behavior because she wasn't paying attention to him or something. So they impounded his car. DNA was taken from him. This investigation would go on. All we know is that she had been seen with Alex Wilson and this group of people, including this guy, Maurice, which nobody knew. They didn't really know him. So it would take a while for people to get his name or anything. This is, like I said, Friday night. Saturday, Sunday goes by. Monday, July 30th, Janine fails to show up for her job at, at, at Amdahl. Like I said, she had been employed there for 12 years. She never missed work without telling people, you know, if she was sick or calling in and letting them know. So that was a big red flag. Her friend Janice had been trying to reach her and her cell phone calls were going straight to voicemail. So she knew her, her cell phone was turned off, which was not, of course, like her. And she was very concerned. So Janice calls her landlady who lives, I guess it's like a the cottage was kind of semi-detached to this other place where her landlady lives. So she calls her to say, you know, have you seen Janine? She said, I have, really haven't seen her since Friday. So now her friend is very, very worried. So the landlady then calls the police, and she also calls Janine's parents, Jess and Georgette. And her brother, Wayne, also shows up at the cottage when the police show up. So they let themselves in, and the police department that is first on the case is the Los Gatos Montesorino Police Department. Now, Los Gatos is a small town. Monte Serino, they kind of are right next to each other. Two very small towns. Monte Serino is pretty affluent town. Los Gatos, most of it is where Janine lived. It was kind of more of a working class neighborhood. You know, it is a nice area, but it's a very small place and a very small police department. They find her car. It's a black 2000 Ford Mustang. It's still parked in the driveway. Like I said, they let themselves in. The cottage is very neat and clean, almost immaculate. Her bed has not been slept in. The clothes that she wore on Friday night, according to her friend Janice, are nowhere to be found. They're not in the house. Her purse, car keys, and cell phone are also missing. They find one shot glass in the sink and two credit cards of hers on the counter. But when they walk into the living room and they see some things missing, her friend Janice lets out a scream because right away she said, my heart just dropped because this, I thought, is not good. She had in her living room, in her small living room, a little five by seven red and blue colored Persian style rug. And Janine loved that rug. She said that was like her little private possession. She loved the way it looked in her room, in her living room, and it was just gone. And she's like, that is very weird and, and very chilling. Beyond that, there were two sofa cushions missing from the couch as well as the sofa slip cover were all gone. I mean, you imagine what's in your mind immediately, right? Somebody has cleaned up this place. This is probably a crime scene. The Los Gatos Monte Serena police start the investigation. There's some problems though, pretty much right away. First of all, dozens of police officers walk through and around the house. Right away, her friends and family think something has happened to her. She's been abducted. She's been hurt and taken away. Something has happened. But the police, because she's an adult woman, they just classify it as a missing person. But they don't see any evidence of a crime. At least they're not seeing blood. They're not seeing, you know, the house in disarray, none of that. So they think, okay, this is um, a missing person. Even so, you know, you'd think you'd be careful of the crime scene. But again, this is a very small police department. They had one homicide detective, and they don't get a lot of homicides there, to be honest. So they're not that experienced. It was days before search dogs were brought to the house, which our parents thought was the wrong thing to do. Like maybe they could have got some clues right away. And there was only one homicide investigator, like I said, for three months when finally, it was months later, that additional investigators from the San Jose Police Department, which is a much bigger police department with several homicide detectives who are experienced, they finally were asked in on the case. They were going to try to focus on these last two people that they knew were with Janine. So over, you know, the next several months, they interviewed over 200 people, you know, people that 
Mia may have seen her that night from the bartenders, to wait staff, the places she was at, to the people that she had maybe uh, socialized with that night. And I mean, just tons of people, neighbors, everybody. The DA was finally handed the case in January. So remember, this was in July. And at that point, three DAs were assigned to the case. Now, what happened was they were focusing on, like I said, the last two men that she had spent time with that night, which was 39-year-old Alex Wilson III and 43-year-old Maurice Xavier Nesma. Now, Alex Wilson, he was a pretty well-known person in this very local area that I've been talking about. He was actually the owner of a place called Wilson's Jewel Bakery in Santa Clara, which is another town. I actually attended Santa Clara University. It's a you know nice town not too far from here. Now, the Wilson's Jewel Bakery is like in a little downtown area right next to the university. If you're in, you know, you have your local community and there's these establishments that everybody knows, like, oh my God, you got to go there. It's got the best breakfast or this place. And you tell everybody who comes in, you have to go get, you know, pizza at this pizza place, whatever. Well, Wilson's was like that. It was like the bakery you go to. That's where you go to get your birthday cakes, all of that. Like I got birthday cakes for my kids at Wilson's Jewel Bakery because it's just like was the best, right? And he was the owner of it. Alex Wilson came from a very prominent Santa Clara family who was politically connected. His father actually served as the mayor of Santa Clara in the 1960s. So that was one of the things people thought was like, okay, are they going to really investigate this guy? Because even people have this idea that, you know, the cops know his family and maybe they won't really take it seriously, but they really did investigate him. He was actually the first one. As a matter of fact, Janine's family would later say they think that they spent too much time investigating him and not enough on Maurice, who was, we know, was the last person, the last, last, last person seen with her. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about Maurice Nesma. He was an architect with uh, Sugimuro Associates in Campbell, California. He worked here locally. We don't know a whole lot about him. Later on, they'll find out more, but he's, you know, just some guy that works here. He's an architect. He was active in his industry and all of that, but, you know, he wasn't a well-known person like Alex Wilson was. So during this investigation, when they're interviewing witnesses, one thing that they heard from a neighbor of Janine's in the area said that he had heard a, quote, loud percussive sound near her apartment after midnight on that Friday night. Right after that, he looked outside and he saw a bald man about 40 years old driving away from her apartment. Now, later on, find out that this matches the description of Maurice Nesma. But Janine's case was not classified as a homicide for six months. And that was another delay in this investigation. The investigation would turn up some things, though, that were important. They dusted her home and her car for fingerprints. They didn't find anything in the house. But on her, on her car, on her passenger door, was Nesma's fingerprint. Now, that's how they figured out his name and who he was and able to go, you know, contact him. Even though this right away became a story in the newspapers, on the television news, in the area, local television news, Janine Harms was missing, her picture was everywhere, where she was last seen at the Rock Bottom Brewery and in, in the shopping center, he did not come forward. So that already was kind of a red flag for investigators later on because they had to identify him from his fingerprint. And the reason he had fingerprints on file is that he was in the system. It was found that there was two criminal court records on him. When they looked them up, it said that they had been purged due to age. So they were like older court filings, something in the criminal courts, but they couldn't see what they were, which I didn't know that happens. I don't know if that's something you can request because maybe it was not like it didn't go anywhere, but it was it had been filed. So maybe you can request that those are those be purged or they just got purged after a certain amount of time. I don't know. But anyway, so they weren't able to see what those were, but they did have his fingerprints on file because of that. So that's how they were able to find him. When they did find him, they took a DNA sample from him. They also uh, took his car and and seized other items to do forensic tests. They had already done this on Alex Wilson. They had taken his car and his DNA, like I said, but apparently didn't find anything they thought connected to the case. Nesma, right, he would be cooperative at first, but he would pretty soon after they were really looking at him seriously, 
he lawyered up and he referred all questions to his attorney. So he stopped, you know, cooperating. Janice told the investigators that, and Janice was Janine's friend, said that the cottage, her cottage was just too clean. So he said, we had been roommates more than once. She said, I knew how she was. If she was going to socialize with people that night, there would have been beer bottles out. There would have been CDs taken out that she would be playing on the stereo. And so she said the fact that she walked into that house and it was so clean and then found out she was supposed to have gone and gotten beer and have people coming over. She said, no, that doesn't make sense to me. She also said that her friend would have never fallen asleep with the man in her house that she didn't know. That didn't ring true at all of what Nesma said. The investigation just wasn't getting very far. So her family decided that they were going to spend a lot of their own time and resources to try and get answers. They hired a private investigator. They lobbied local politicians to get more resources allocated to the investigation, like more police, you know, more detectives on the case. They also asked a Los Gatos council member if she could try to get police to search the nearby landfill with heavy equipment because they're like, this rug is missing. What they are thinking right away is she or some other evidence was rolled up in this rug and taken somewhere. So they were trying all of these things to try to find Janine or what happened to her. Her brother, Craig Sanchez, coordinated the search. Everybody was you know, involved, but he kind of led the coordination. They were able to do, get some things, though, because they were really very persistent and trying to get her story out there and the story of their, you know, her, her disappearance. Janine's disappearance actually was featured on America's Most Wanted on the television program that's a nationwide program. They put up billboards, they handed out flyers, they did every media interview they could do to keep this in the news. And they, they also had a website, findjanine.com, trying to get tips. Because of all the attention that the family, the family was the one who really pushed to keep her in the news, because this was going on for some time. She had gone missing in July of 2001. Now, in 2004, because the family kept all of this in the news, including the descriptions of everything that was missing from the home, including the rug. Because of this, a woman came forward in 2004 and said she had found Janine's Persian rug rolled up in a dumpster at a construction site near her home. She called the police and they came out and they found this rug. The dumpster where the rug was found was a half a mile from Nazma's home. Now, this is the, the other strange connection to where I live. It was found in a dumpster at Lee and Hillsdale Avenue. There's a big shopping center there where there's a Home Depot and uh, a gym and stuff. And I, I'm pretty sure that's probably where it was. She happened to see it and her and her daughter went and, and, and retrieved it because they're like, wow, this is a nice rug. Somebody threw it out. Now, there wasn't any blood or anything on that rug. So now you got to wonder what happened, right? So this, this is the part we don't know, and this is the part that's going to remain a mystery, but we do have this rug now. The county crime lab now took the fibers from this rug, and they matched those fibers to fibers found in the bed of Nazma's Jeep. They also found that Janine was working on a latch hook rug, you know, the ones you make, and some of these fibers were also found that were similar were found in his car. And lastly, he matched the description of the man seen driving away early in the morning that she disappeared. So finally, in December of 2004, three and a half years after Janine's disappearance, Nazma was charged in her murder and held without bail. Okay, we're going to go to court with this evidence. But when you have a circumstantial case, it hinges so much on this evidence that you have to be so careful. Now, like I said, there was already some problems because of, you know, the crime scene was not preserved very well. There was other things like that. So that was going to be a problem. But we have these rug fibers. The technician who certified at the preliminary hearing that this fiber evidence found in Nesma's vehicle was a match to Janine's rug that was missing and now found. The defense was able to object to this technician's findings because they found out that he had failed 
proficiency tests in fiber analysis while he was going through his training. They filed to have his testimony thrown out. His testimony was thrown out, but the investigation continued. And the prosecutor said the evidence had to be retested. So this led to delays. And like I said, Nazma had been in jail since the end of 2004. In June of 2007, his lawyer was able to successfully argue that his client's right to a speedy trial had been violated because it had been so long since he had been arrested and they were still waiting for this trial. The judge had to agree with that. And in June 2007, he released Nesma. He had been in jail for a little over two years. So the prosecutor vowed to refile these charges, but Nesma would remain free for the next three and a half years. We have still not found Janine. We have this evidence that's supposed to be retested, but for some reason that's dragging on and it hasn't happened yet, or it hasn't been brought back to the court. I'm not sure what happened there, but there was a, a huge delay. So in 2007, he was released. Now, basically nothing happened. The parents, of course, are still trying to keep this case in the news and do all this, but it's, it's difficult when something has gone so long People start to lose interest. The case starts to go cold. You know, it's just very, very frustrating. So now we're going to fast forward to January 2011. This is a decade after she has disappeared. On Saturday, January 15th, and here's where the twist comes in, you guys. This is crazy. So January 2011, it was Saturday, January 15th. Like I said, a decade after Janine Harm's disappearance. Wayne Sanchez, Janine's now 52-year-old brother, who is living with his parents in West San Jose. He drives down just a mile or so from where he lives to go to a restaurant. It's the Red Robin restaurant, another chain, right here in a big shopping center in West San Jose called the El Paseo de Saratoga. Now, this is a bigger shopping center in the parking lot. There's the big Red Robin restaurant across the, the parking lot is our big AMC theater. And there's some other various shops and restaurants in there as well. Wayne Sanchez walks into the Red Robin. This Red Robin, I know, again, it's near my house. We've gone there many, many times. And you walk in and the bar is right at the front of the restaurant. So you're in a little, little waiting area and then right next to it is the bar. And then, you know, you wait there and then they take you back to the dining room, to your table, whatever. But a lot of people just kind of hang out in the bar. Well, Wayne Sanchez goes in there for some reason. I believe he was alone. I'm not exactly sure, but I don't recall them saying anybody was with him. He just happens to go into this restaurant. Guess who's in the bar on a date is Maurice Nesma. Well, Wayne sees this man who he believes with his whole heart and soul has murdered his sister and disposed of her body, which they don't know where. So he sees him and right away he confronts him. They get into a verbal altercation. I don't know exactly what was said. It didn't sound like, you know, there was any physical uh, violence or anything that was just a verbal altercation. Wayne Sanchez then leaves the bar and Nazma, I guess, thinking everything's over and his date walk out of the restaurant. Well, instead of getting in their car and driving off somewhere, they walk down. Like I said, this is a big shopping center. They walk a couple of doors down. There's a Pete's coffee shop there. They go into Pete's, I guess, to grab a cup of coffee this is about, you know, nine o'clock at night. There's a lot of people there. This is a very busy shopping center. The coffee shop is full of people. Nesbin's there waiting in line or something, getting, you know, coffee with his date. Wayne Sanchez now returns, walks into Pete's coffee shop, which is a very small coffee shop. So this had to be something. He returns, walks in, pulls out a gun and shoots Nesma dead in front of everybody. Of course, people start screaming, running out of the coffee shop. It's, you know, it's, it's chaos. Wayne Sanchez calmly walks out, leaves, and returns to his car in the parking lot. Now, we're not sure, but I've read a couple of different instances that either, and I think this is probably most likely the case, that when he left the Red Robin restaurant, Wayne, he was very angry. This is what he believes his sister's murderer there, and he's just out, you know, having a great time with the date. And he still has no idea where his sister is and what happened to her. So he drives home because he lives really close by. It probably was maybe a three or four minute drive. 
he drives home and gets the gun and comes back. So some people said, oh, did he have the gun in the car? I don't think so. I think that he drove home and came back because there was a little bit of time in between because there was time for Nesma to get to the coffee shop. Sanchez now returns to his car, sits in the parking lot in the car, and shoots himself in the head and kills himself. Right as officers are arriving because they heard about a shooting in the Pete's coffee shop. Oh my God. So that's just like tragedy upon tragedy, right? So now what do we do? I mean, this guy has not been convicted of murder, but he's now dead. Do they just let this go? No. The DA decides he wants to close this case. So he continues to work to get this fiber evidence. Now, this is years later. Nobody really understands why it's taken so long. But apparently, some big box of, you know, whatever was sent to a lab like the month after Wayne Sanchez shot Maurice Nesma, and now they're both dead. It was a month after. So I'm thinking this is a PR thing, like... This is bad optics, you guys. You know, we didn't solve this, and now these two men are dead. And so they're like, we have to wrap this up because this ain't good. You know, this isn't going to look good for re-election or whatever. And I think they also did want to close the case, but I just wish they would have done it earlier because her family had no answers. You know, maybe this would have given them a little bit of peace. Obviously, her brother needed some peace because this just, it literally killed him. So in August 2011, a news conference was held. This is, you know, the summer after this tragedy happens. A news conference is held by our district attorney here, Jeff Rosen. And you might recognize that name. He was also the district attorney during the Sierra Lamar case. So another no-body case here in our uh, Santa Clara County. DA Rosen tells the media at this press conference that now new lab tests have finally come back. He has now in his hands a 48-page report from the top forensic lab called Microtrace. They had retested the key fiber evidence in the case. 13 fibers found in the cargo area of Nesma's Jeep were from the missing Persian rug. He said they had definitively proved that that was from that rug. 14 other fibers found in his car were from a latch hook rug kit that Janine had been working on. And this, again definitively matched. Other additional evidence that Rosen said that proved that Nesma was Janine Harm's murderer was that he outlined Nesma's, quote, history of violence against women. And I'll talk about that in a second. But he also said they had evidence that Nesma had, quote, taken all the full and empty beer cans with him when he left Janine's house, which he said, quote, Nesma was determined to leave no evidence that could incriminate him, unquote. The prosecutors now said they considered the case closed, but Janine Sanchez Harm's body has never been found. Now, I'll just do the last part here. Nesma's former attorney disputed the evidence of his history of violence against women. He pointed out that there were exactly two complaints against him. And the attorney would say that one of these complaints was made by a, quote, third party. But when the woman was interviewed, she herself said it had been, quote, an accident. I don't know who the woman was or what her relationship to Nesma was. Again, these were the files that were purged, apparently. The other complaint was made by a former college roommate of Nesma's who said that she had been assaulted by him when she was in the bathtub. So Nesma's mother apparently had hired, this is according to the attorney, he said that his mother had hired a private investigator who reported that there was no bathtub in that house that they were renting. So apparently, you know, he's saying that she's lying. Nesma himself had always claimed that he was innocent. He did a couple of interviews, not many, after he was released from jail and said that he was absolutely innocent. Some people still point to Alex Wilson and thought that he was not investigated thoroughly enough. There was some 
report, and I have not confirmed this, but there was some report that his car was not searched and tested the way that Nesma's was. They also said that when they had the tracking dogs come out, that they got a hit and began howling near Alex Wilson's Mercedes-Benz for Janine's scent, which I don't know if that's true because I didn't see anything except for one newspaper report of that. What happened to Janine Harms? That's the thing. We don't know. Obviously, the rug was put into his car. Some other things were put into his car that were from Janine Harms' home. But where is her body? You know, it's one of those things people say, well, was her body wrapped up in the rug? It's possible, but I don't believe that she was bludgeoned or something because as far as I can tell, there wasn't any blood evidence found. Could it have been a strangling, a suffocation? You know, I think about the Scott Peterson, Lacey Peterson case. That's not going to leave that kind of evidence at the crime scene. So it's possible, but he didn't dump the body where he dumped the carpet, if that's true. So where's the body? That's a head scratcher. I mean, the rest makes sense to me, but where her body is, that's a head scratcher to me. So let me know what you guys think. Have you heard of cases like this? Was the body found? What were some of the ways that people tried to dispose of evidence, a body? I think sometimes you can look at some other cases and maybe make some kind of guesses as to maybe what happened. But every time I go to this shopping center here and I pass by the Rock Bottom Brewery, I think of Janine Harms. And I did not know the woman, but it's just such a tragic, tragic thing. Just that maybe a chance encounter with somebody one night and she disappears. The heartache that her parents have gone through, first of all, losing their daughter, then losing their son. You know, I can't even imagine what that is like. So that's one of those stories. It's almost like you wouldn't believe it was true if you saw it on a television program. You're like, okay, well, that's pretty dramatic. That has to be fiction, right? But it's absolutely true. So I thought it was an interesting story. And the fact that it's, it's such a local story to me has always uh, made me a little bit more fascinated with it, I guess. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back next week to begin the first new series of the new year. Make sure you follow or subscribe so you don't miss an episode. If you'd like to have access to ad-free episodes and bonus episodes and get OUAC perks sent to you, all you have to do is become a Patreon member to join the party. Go to patreon.com slash onceuponacrime to find out more and join. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Lorena Garcia is our administrative assistant and provided additional research and audio editing assistance for this episode. Until next time, be good to one another.